The Marine Nationale, or French Navy, was in a very interesting place after the First World War, namely with their capital ships. Because of the hardships of the Great War and the post-war environment not exactly being conducive to ship construction. Even before the First World War, France had lost its status as a first-rate naval power. Because of these conditions, it was even more evident as they had already relegated their rather interesting pre-dreadnoughts to training ships, and with the surviving dreadnoughts of the Corbet and Bretagne classes getting rather old and experiencing troubles due to their age. Following the Washington Naval Treaty, the Marine Nationale had some concerns about foreign cruisers. Some of these fears included the Japanese using their new fast and heavily armed cruisers to cut France's communications to her far eastern colonies like French Indochina. And soon enough, another threat emerged, the rebuilding Reichsmarine. But the major concern was the rapidly growing and modernizing Regia Marina. French naval planners feared the Italians would employ their new fast treaty cruisers against French shipping in the western Mediterranean and disrupt communication between France and her colonies in North Africa. Not to mention this fast and increasingly independent striking force of Italian cruisers was going to be protected by air cover from Italian air bases in the Mediterranean islands of Sardinia, Sicily, and the mainland. After subsequent treaties in the 1930s, French designers looked at ships that weren't intended to fight in a line of battle, but be some new type of large cruiser or battle cruiser, eventually leading to the Dunkirk class. In the late 1920s, French naval designers put together some designs for these new large cruisers, including a 17,500 ton design dated to 1926. Designed to have sufficient speed and gun power to hunt down and kill the lightly protected treaty cruisers. The ship's design was a rough outline for the future Dunkirk, having a top speed of 35 knots and a main armament of 8 305mm 55 caliber guns and two quadruple turrets forward. This design was attractive due to its speed and the employment of already developed technology. With their armament, they could theoretically be placed in the line of battle, but due to their poor protection, it left them vulnerable to the larger guns of enemy navies. Because of their speed advantage over the Italian dreadnoughts, the Marine Nationale felt they could be used as scouts for the equally old French battle fleet. As tempting as this design was, the idea of a ship that couldn't fight in the line of battle, eating into capital ship tonnage, was found to not be very practical. In 1927, French designers increased the tonnage of what they wanted up to 37,000 tons and a 33-knot top speed, with 12 305mm guns and 3 quadruple turrets, 2 forward and 1 aft, along with 12 130mm guns and 3 quadruple turrets, and having a similar anti-aircraft protection as the French cruisers Colbert and Foch along with some trainable torpedo tubes for good measure. There are variations to this design, with a 27-knot variant armed with 406mm guns. The armor on these ships was increased from the previous 17,500-ton design, something similar to the protection found on the U.S. battleships of the Pennsylvania and Nevada classes, with heavy belt armor and a thick deck intended to resist plunging fire. This design also incorporated a new splinter deck below the main armored deck, covering the machinery spaces and magazines. This design was not used for a number of reasons, with some of the main reasons being the financial state of France during this period, the fact that they did not have the naval infrastructure to develop a ship of this size, requiring a massive rework of French naval infrastructure. The London Naval Treaty kicked the Marine Nationale into gear, so to speak. The financial strains placed on the country from the destruction of the First World War and the tumultuous times of the interwar period made capital ship construction a little hard to fathom, as I mentioned in the intro. With the international situation worsening and their rivalry with the Italians, which by this point was reaching a fever pitch, I know I've shoehorned this quote in before, but it's just so good. And to get some perspective, we will look at the Franco-Italian rivalry, Current History 1916-1940, Volume 38, Number 3 by B.Z. Goldberg from June 1933, who opens up by saying, quote, The immediate danger to the peace of Europe lies somewhere between Rome and the implacable Balkans, for Italy has dared to challenge French hegemony. Germany, despite all her potential might and menace, is but the background to the impending, possibly final struggle between Caesar and Gaul. Given these factors and the French battle line becoming an issue due to their age, it was clear that the construction of capital ships could not be held off any longer. Even if they were able to get a design completed and laid down by 1931, the earliest it could be ready for service would be 1935, and with the international situation worsening, this was not ideal. The time to act had come. 
The French General Staff, in the wake of the London Naval Treaty, initially proposed several design tonnages for the new capital ships, with a minimum displacement of 23,333 tons and a max tonnage of 25,000 tons, and thought that they could have three of these ships. The General Staff had discussions, including other proposals. All these proposals came with the rebuilding Reichsmarine in mind, as the previous year in 1929, they had laid down the first Panzerschiff of the Deutschland class, where I have discussed those at length in my videos on the ships of that class. This new heavily armed German cruiser caused quite the stir for the Marine Nationale, because they wanted their new ships to be able to have the armor and armament to fight these new German cruisers. Eventually coming up with these design parameters, a standard displacement of 25,000 tons, a main armament of 330mm guns and two quadruple turrets forward, a secondary battery of 130mm guns, protection sufficient to resist 280mm shells or a 500kg bomb released at 3,000m, and underwater protection sufficient to resist a 300kg charge. The tonnage increased to 26,500 tons to accommodate the increase in gun size. With these specifications, the Marine Nationale thought they had a design that could handle the new German Panzerschiff threat in the Atlantic, and should the situation arise, they could assist the older, heavier ships of the Britannia class against the Regia Marina. The order for the Dunkirk was placed in October of 1932. It should be noted the design of Dunkirk and Strasbourg did vary in several areas. Dunkirk had a standard displacement of 26,500 tons, a normal displacement of 30,750 tons, and a full load displacement of 35,500 tons. Dunkirk had small tube water boilers that gave steam to four geared steam turbines, which drove four shafts producing around 107,000 shaft horsepower, giving the ship a design top speed of 29.5 knots. The main armament consisted of eight 330mm 52 caliber guns and two quadruple turrets forward. She had a secondary battery of 16 130mm guns and three quadruple and two twin mountings. Additional anti-aircraft firepower was provided by 10 37mm anti-aircraft guns and five twin mountings, and 32 13.2mm machine guns and eight quad mountings. For some basics of the armor, her belt had a thickness of 225mm and a deck of 115mm. Her turrets had a face thickness of 330mm. Dunkirk was laid down in December 1932, launched in October 1935, and entered service in September 1938. In April 1936, she conducted a long series of trials that would last several months, intermittently heading to port for further work. In May of 1937, Dunkirk represented France at the fleet review at Spithead for King George VI's coronation, apparently making a strong impression at the review. A further review on the 27th of May combined the Mediterranean and Atlantic squadrons following combined exercises. The next several months saw Dunkirk having more trials, including gunnery trials, along with accompanying foreign dignitaries in their visits to France. During the Sudetenland crisis, Dunkirk and other elements of the Atlantic squadron went to the Azores to cover the return of a French training cruiser, which was done because of the presence of a large German detachment. Finally, by September 1st, 1938, Dunkirk officially entered service and became the flagship of the Atlantic Squadron, flying the flag of the Commander-in-Chief of the Squadron, Vice Admiral Jean Soule. Late April 1939 saw Strasbourg and Dunkirk together. The ships now formed the 1st Battle Division. They then went to Portugal on a goodwill visit, and then returned to the Port of Brest to entertain a British squadron that was visiting on the 7th of May 1939. The future Force de Ray did exercises off the British coast until late June, and then during July and August, they conducted more exercises, this time off the coast of Brittany. By the time war was declared, and with discussions with the British, the French had taken primary responsibility for protecting the Allied trade routes from the Gulf of Guiana to the Channel, including the waters off the North African coast and Portuguese coast and the Bay of Biscay. But more importantly, the French would have the Force de Raid, which was composed of a force based out of Brest being made up of the two battleships, three modern light cruisers, and eight of the most modern destroyers that were to hunt enemy surface raiders in the area east of the line running from Uisson to the Azores to the Cape Verde Islands. During the first few months of the war, Dunkirk helped in several operations, including convoy escort work and hunting for the German battleships of the Scharnhorst class. The two had sorted near Iceland and sunk the armed merchant cruiser Ralpindi, and while hunting for them with HMS Hood, Dunkirk suffered damage due to the foul weather. 
with her bow constantly underwater during her time in those rough seas. To quote from French Battleships 1922-1956 by John Jordan and Robert Dumas, they write, The combination of the lack of freeboard forward and the fine lines and construction of the bow was from this moment recognized as a serious design defect that would be difficult to remedy and would result in regular damage in heavy weather. With that being said, Dunkirk was back in service relatively soon, and on December 11th, she was loaded with cases of gold from the Bank of France, heading for Canada in company with the cruiser Glois and escorts of contra torpilles. These escorts stuck around for the first two days, leaving Dunkirk and Glois to push on to Halifax. On their return trip to Europe, they bolstered convoy TC2 along with the battleship HMS Revenge, returning to the port of Brest by the 30th of December. In early January 1940, Dunkirk was in dock again until the 6th of February, for repairs and modifications, being moved in the meantime to a fitting out area for the modifications to be completed, which was done so in mid-February, doing exercises for the next couple of months. After the Admiral Graf Spee scuttling at the end of 1939, the threat of surface raiders in the Atlantic was significantly diminished. However, with Italy's close ties to Germany, it was feared that they would join the war on the side of the Germans, and the Mediterranean Sea would become exponentially more dangerous. So, in response, it was decided that the force to raid was to head to Mers el Kabir in Algiers on the North African coast, to operate against the Regia Marina, or to move through the Straits of Gibraltar and operate against any German surface raiders in the Atlantic. A majority of the force to raid, including both Strasbourg and Dunkirk, headed to North Africa, leaving Brest on April 2nd, making the journey in three days. The stay in North Africa was fleeting because a joint Franco-British operation was going to be carried out in Norway causing the Force de Raid to return to Brest. The Force de Raid prepared to escort troop ships and supplies to Norwegian waters, but just to make things more convoluted, it was decided again the Force de Raid should return to Mers el Kabir due to the worsening situation in the Mediterranean. Dunkirk left Brest on the 24th, followed by Strasbourg and other elements of the Force de Raid. The main force arrived at Mers el Kabir on April 27th. Dunkirk and Strasbourg followed this up with exercises on the 9th of May, with other ships of the group, but nothing of note took place until the 10th of June when Italy joined the war. When Italy did join the war, the force to raid was at full strength and was joined by other elements of the Marine Nationale. The larger capital ships were at Mers el Kabir, while the cruisers and contra torpilles were at Oran and Algiers. With the Battle of France raging, these French vessels were training off the North African coast to face the Regia Marina. On the 12th of June, they received information that suggested that the Kriegsmarine intended to force itself through the Strait of Gibraltar, with a force of battleships to reinforce the Regia Marina. In response to this, the French sortied and assembled south of Cartagena, Spain. After essentially chasing themselves around in the Mediterranean due to this faulty information, they returned to Mers el-Kabir. This was to be the last sortie for Dunkirk in the war. What came next was Operation Catapult, or the attack on Mers el-Kabir. We've discussed Operation Catapult in previous videos, and each time there have been some rather interesting and sometimes hateful comments. Let me just say it's a controversial topic and can ruffle some feathers, so if there are discussions in the comments, let's all try to be civil and have a productive discussion about the subject. With that being said, let's push on to the topic at hand. Operation Catapult took place in a confusing time in the Second World War, after the defeat of the French army in the subsequent Franco-German armistice. Important to our story, Admiral of the Fleet Darlan made assurances to the British that the French fleet was not to be handed over to the Germans, and from French battleships, any attempt by the Germans to seize French ships by force would be met by the implementation of sabotage measures already in place. However, once Darlan had joined the Pathan regime, their trust in him waned, and I think a quote from Bernard Ireland's The War in the Mediterranean is apt. Admiral Darlan was no great Anglophile, and he ignored Churchill's extravagantly worded appeals to rally the Allied cause. While the British never doubted the honor of Darlan's motives and intentions, there was still the high probability of German duplicity. The ships had to be put beyond the enemy's reach. During nine months of ocean warfare, it had cooperated and strengthened its ties with the Royal Navy, but it was now scattered. Most personnel wished to remain loyal to France's legitimate government. But with the nation in a divided and confused state, it was difficult to determine what constituted legitimacy. Although a French naval delegation under Vice Admiral Odenal remained in the United Kingdom, communications between the fleeing French government and the UK were difficult as they were pushed farther south from Paris and eventually to Vichy in southern France. 
By June 23rd, the armistice terms were available to the British War Cabinet. For Prime Minister Winston Churchill, First Lord of the Admiralty Albert Victor Alexander, and First Sea Lord Dudley Pound, the biggest issue concerning the French fleet was Article 8, which stated, The French fleet, except that part left at the disposition of the government to safeguard French interests in its colonial empire, will be assembled in ports to be determined and is to be demobilized and disarmed under German or Italian supervision. The designation of these ports will be made according to the ship's home ports in peacetime. The German government solemnly declared that it had no interest in using during the war, for its purposes, that part of the French fleet stationed in occupied ports, with the exception of units necessary for coastal patrols and mine sweeping. It further declares solemnly and expressly that it has no interest in making claims on the French fleet after the war ends except that part of the French fleet yet to be determined, which is to be tasked with safeguarding French interests in her colonial empire. All warships currently outside her territorial waters must be recalled to France. It is important to note that there is no official English version of this, and some of the words could be interpreted differently. A word that was left ambiguous was the French word, which was interpreted the French ships would be under German and or Italian control. Now, the context that that word is written in makes it clear that it refers to the process by which the deactivation of the ships would be verified and monitored and probably better translated as supervision. The French had agreed that German and Italian officials were charged with supervising the state of readiness of the French fleet, and pretty much anything the Marine Nationale wanted to do would have to go through this Italo-German Armistice Commission. However, the idea that the Germans and Italians should hold control over the French fleet was something that made Churchill feel less than enthused about. He became enthralled with the idea that the Germans were going to seize the French ships and thus threaten the dominance of the Royal Navy in Europe. As evidence, Churchill pointed out the numerous agreements that Hitler had broken previously, which, to be fair, was a valid point by Churchill. To play devil's advocate, the fact that with modern hindsight, Hitler probably didn't have designs on the French fleet for multiple reasons. One was that when the German Navy began expanding in the 1930s, they'd been experiencing manpower issues, and with the acquisition of the French fleet, it would have exacerbated those issues even further. Not to mention, with the continuing success of the U-boat campaign and other German-made ships soon to enter service, it was just not practical. Along with the logistical problems the ships would cause, the different caliber guns, ammunition, fire control equipment, and machinery something that was going to be difficult to overcome with ships as large as Dunkirk or Strasbourg. The French were also to return the incomplete battleships Jean Bart and Richelieu to Toulon, with the Dunkirk and Strasbourg to remain at Merzel Kabir, and the older battleships to go to Bizerta to demobilize. But the Germans vetoed the proposal to return the incomplete battleships to Toulon for fear of the British seizing them while transiting the Straits of Gibraltar. With all of that being said, Hitler was certainly not sound of mind, and his opinion could have changed on a whim. I'll leave you to debate this in the comments. In late June, the British were going to take action to ensure the security of their war effort, with the French merchant ships in the UK being impounded. The French ships in Alexandria were forbidden to leave. By the 27th of June 1940, the British War Cabinet made the decision that the French fleet in Mers el Kabir should either be coerced into fighting alongside their former ally or be sunk by aggressive action, to which plans were drawn up for what became known as Operation Catapult. Things kicked off when the British destroyer Foxhound arrived at the mouth of the Anchorage early on the morning of July 3rd. And within an hour, the capital ships of Force H arrived northwest of the Anchorage under Admiral James Somerville, causing confusion and chaos amongst the French sailors of the ships held up in Mers el Kabir. When it came time to negotiations, the British sent Captain Holland as he was skilled in speaking French, and it was a former naval attaché to France. However, Vice Admiral Jean Soule, in charge of the forces at Mers el Kabir, initially refused to engage in talks as he feared breaking the terms of the armistice and then wanted to discuss any terms with an officer of equal rank, i.e. Somerville, who was tied to his flagship to make sure the operation went smoothly. So Holland began negotiations with the junior officer of Jen Sewell's staff and then was Jen Sewell's flag captain. Eventually, the vice admiral was presented with an ultimatum from Somerville, which gave the French several options. One, to join the British and continue the fight against the Italians and Germans, two, sail with reduced crews to a British port, or three, sail with reduced crews to a French port in the West Indies. And Somerville ended it by saying, If you refuse these fair offers, I must, with profound regret, require you to sink your ships within six hours. Jean Sewell responded to this by having his fleet prepare to break out and fight. While this was going on, he was trying to contact Arlon for advice, 
trying to play for time so that the French fleet might escape under the haze of the oppressive heat of the North African coast, under the cover of night. While the French forces continued to prepare for action, Force H was outside pacing back and forth, spotting aircraft flying over the anchorage, and at 105, a swordfish from Ark Royal dropped magnetic mines in the narrow pass to enter the harbor. Negotiations continued to drag on between the two sides. Was Jean Sewell playing for time while waiting for Darlan to respond, which he never would, and Somerville trying to explore every option to find some way to get the French to agree to his ultimatum? Due to the complications that either Jean Sewell or Somerville faced because of their respective hindrances, a compromise was never made, even though there were attempts throughout the day. By 525, French ships were ordered to action stations to attempt a breakout. At 554, Force H began opening fire on the French ships in port, where Ted Briggs, an eventual survivor of HMS Hood, has this to say. The guns of the Resolution and Valiant roared in a murderous hair-trigger reaction. Then came the ting-ting of our firing bell. It was an awesome sight as shells continued to plunge in the harbor area. Jean Sewell was on Dunkirk's flag bridge when lookouts reported the gun flashes. In dropping his binoculars, he gave the order to fire. At the same time, Jean Sewell was ordering his ships to full steam and to begin their breakout, with four destroyers moving towards the pass, followed by Strasbourg, and was supposed to be followed by Dunkirk with the slow battleships Bretagne and Provence in the rear. Dunkirk and Provence opened fire at the British, but Dunkirk was still moored to the jetty four minutes after the action had begun and got free with the help of a tug. Subsequently, she was hit by four 15-inch shells, two penetrating her armor belt amidships and exploding in the machinery spaces, which caused her to lose speed and all electrical power, and she was beached in shallow waters opposite her mooring. Dunkirk sustained some serious damage from those 15-inch shells that hit her, especially those 15-inch shells that hit her armor belt, which essentially left the ship helpless, not being able to fight or run. Dunkirk was evacuated at 8 p.m. with 800 crew being disembarked, and 360 men being left on board. The ship was beached for some 30 meters of her bow and had taken on 700 tons of water to starboard, and 150 tons had been allowed in the port ballast tanks to stabilize her. There were fires in parts of the ship that were under control by the following day. Jean Sue was optimistic that the ship would be able to be moved to Toulon for full repairs and refurbishment. However, the British were planning another attack on Dunkirk, this time with torpedoes from Swordfish. We're in the struggle for the Middle Sea, the Great Navies at War in the Mediterranean Theater, 1940-1945, Vincent P. O'Hara has this to say. On 6 July, a strike from Ark Royal against Dunkirk inflicted additional damage. A torpedo sank the patrol vessel Tanov, and then a second torpedo hit the wreck and detonated 42 death charges aboard. The massive explosion that followed sent a tower of debris-strewn water into the air, severely damaging Dunkirk, and killed or wounded another 154. Dunkirk was going to be out of action for quite some time now. The beleaguered ship received patchwork and continued to see issues. By early 1942, the ship was starting to be patched up enough to be moved back to Toulon under the greatest secrecy. And at 4.30 a.m. on February 19, 1942, Dunkirk left Merzel Kabir being escorted by destroyers and substantial air cover. She would arrive on the 20th in Toulon for reconstruction and refurbishment. Dunkirk was scuttled in Toulon following the Allied invasion of North Africa as the Germans were coming to seize the fleet. In attempting to scuttle her, there were complications as Dunkirk was in dry dock being repaired, and there were attempts to refloat her to scuttle her properly, but the charges were set, and in the general confusion of the situation, they went off while she was in dry dock and pretty much wrecked the ship. This was effectively the end of the ship. She was sold for scrap in 1955. Thank you all for watching, and please remember to like and subscribe as it'll help the channel to grow. Until next time, my friends, have a great week.